Bernardo, I'm going to ask you to, for a moment, step away from your um, parochial espousing of analytic idealism, which I love and we'll get, we'll get to at other times, uh, but to ask you from a, a perspective uh, of a philosopher of science. You have, the, you have doctoral degrees in philosophy, computer science, you've obviously evaluated theories. What's the process that you use to evaluate diverse theories of consciousness? As you know, I've been focusing on getting a lot of all the theories uh, that are existent, and you know, there are literally over 200 substantial theories of consciousness. How, how do you evaluate them? Well, usually theories of consciousness are metaphysical theories. They are statements about what consciousness is, not about what you will experience next, right. which would be a scientific theory. So when we are dealing with metaphysics, there are more criteria for evaluating a theory than in science alone. Science has experiment. Now, if you make a prediction about what nature will do next, and you run an experiment, and nature doesn't do that, okay. and then your theory is flawed, and that's the yeah. end of it. In metaphysics, it's more complicated and nuanced. We have criteria like, um, one, internal consistency. Your theory should not contradict itself which happens more often than people would <laughs> think yeah, possible, great. right? Another one is empirical adequacy. If your theory implies something about nature that we know not to be true, then your theory uh, doesn't survive that. Um, another one is explanatory power. Your theory should explain something, particularly what experience is, how, how it arises and how, how, how its properties become what they are. So these are all more nuanced uh, criteria for evaluating a theory that uh, don't necessarily disprove a theory. But people think that uh, we can disprove anything. That's not the case. Yeah, uh, there course. are great many things that we cannot disprove. There may be right now a teapot in the orbit of Saturn. Maybe hmm. aliens came to the Earth, stole the teapot from an old lady's house. Hmm brought it back with them, yeah. got bored of it and dumped it and it got caught in the gravity well of Saturn. <laughs> I mean, it, it's possible, right? It cannot be disproven. Yeah, right. But the interesting question is not what is possible. The interesting question is what do we have reasons to entertain as a plausible hypothesis? And the reasons to entertain that hypothesis have to do with internal consistency, explanatory power, empirical adequacy, and so on. How about parsimony? Parsimony is a key one. Uh, it's the one that the teapot in the orbit of Saturn <laughs> fails. Because although it's possible, it requires many assumptions, many theoretical entities, like the aliens and the alien strip to the old lady's house and the old lady's house and all of that. Um, the ideal theory of consciousness is one that uh, postulates as few theoretical entities as possible. Actually, the most ideal theory of consciousness is, is that which starts from nature's only pre-theoretical given, which is the existence of subjectivity. Subjectivity exists. Everything else is a theory that arises within subjectivity. If you can explain everything in terms of subjectivity, that's the, I the ideal theory. Okay, now you're drifting a little bit into your own views, <laughs> but that's fine, that's fine. That's perfectly loud. I do the same thing all the time. Um, the, the argument against your last point, I, I think everything up until that, almost everybody, they don't agree with it, they certainly should. Your last point is, is, would be different. Uh, Einstein famously said, I don't know if it's a real quote, that you know, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler, because his you know, 10 field equations of relativity is not so simple. <laughs> uh, th that's fair. So the question is, can we explain everything in nature in terms of one field of subjectivity? Yeah. If we can, then that's the preferred metaphysics. That's your preferred theory of consciousness. If we cannot, then we have to start complicating things. But again, the question is, can we? If we can reduce everything in nature, every natural phenomenon, every human perception, every human feeling, to one field of subjectivity that spans the whole of nature, then that's obviously the most parsimonious, and that should be preferred. So let me just throw out one uh, s uh, suite of theories that uh, could embed that, that is not idealism or is not purely mental, and that's quantum theory. So there's really a, a large number, there may be 20 or more that I found, and there's probably more of quantum theory. Some of them are quite bizarre, uh, but that's just my opinion, and I could be wrong. Um, and, and they have, uh, it's, it's not, they're all, 
quasi-physical, and you know, there some of them expand the notion of physical, but under uh, an enlarged definition of physics, uh, they could be subsumed. Uh, how do you evaluate those? Uh, quantum physics is a scientific theory. It's, it's a model for us to predict what nature would do next. Um, that model has some theoretical entities which are convenient fictions, like uh, um, uh, the, the, the wave function. It's a epistemic, nice, convenient fiction. It's very operational. We can use it to predict what nature would do next. But when you go, when you go and say those convenient fictions are actually true, and I have to reduce consciousness to those abstractions, now you got yourself tied up in all kinds of epistemic knots. Um, my preferred alternative would be to say, quantum physics is a model of the dynamics of one field of subjectivity in nature. That's, that's what it's telling us about. What are the next patterns of excitation of this one field of subjectivity? That's what quantum physics does. It's a model of that dynamics. So you use the phrases of the excitations of, not, not of quantum fields, but the excitations of subjectivity. Quantum you fields, slip that in there. Yeah. <laughs> quantum fields are, are uh, theoretical entities. Uh, uh, they are defined in terms of their measurable behavior. In other words, they are convenient fictions as well. So uh, in my mind, if we succeed in a grand unification theory, so all 17 quantum fields plus something standing in for gravity, if we succeed in unifying that in one hyperdimensional field, my metaphysical interpretation of that field would be it's a model of subjectivity itself, mm. not my subjectivity or your subjectivity, but a field of subjectivity in nature. Mm. Uh, I like the distinction between the scientific method which is either observation or experimentation, replication, falsification, a very precise way of doing it with what I like to call a scientific way of thinking, which doesn't require necessarily replication because it's, it's dealing with things that are impossible, but requires internal consistency, non-contradiction, exactly. um, maybe parsimony to some degree, a, a way of scientific thinking, a process of thinking. Absolutely. And I think a key component of that is um, for one to pay exquisite attention to one's hidden assumptions. Yes. Because those are the, those are the ones that catch us. Right. Uh, we, make, we make lots of hidden, unexamined assumptions. So a scientific way of thinking turns thought towards itself in a self-critical way um, and requires us to explore what we are taking for granted that we shouldn't, what we are assuming that we shouldn't, and retrace our, step backs, our steps back to places where we may have taken the wrong turn. That's scientific thinking.